What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? 1 800 585 9396. I don't understand why I have to earn salvation. 1 800 585 9396. What's stopping Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hi, everybody. Welcome again to Call to Communion. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters, those of you who have questions about the Catholic faith and you don't know really who to turn to. Uh, Well, maybe if your particular universe doesn't include a lot of Catholics, why not ask a Catholic? Give us a call, 1-800-585-9396, 1-800-585-9396. If you'd like to send us a text, you can text the letters EWTN to 55000, wait for our response, and then text us your first name and your question. Message and data rates may apply. Again, the phone number, 1-800-585-9396. If you want to send us an email, you can do that, ctc at EWTN.com. Michael McCall is our producer. Matt Kabinsky is our phone screener. Jeff Burson is handling handling social media today. I'm Tom Price, along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? You know what? Couldn't be great. I you couldn't, couldn't be, be great, huh? Well, I, well yes, Tom, even se- you can be great. It, it seems to me that I fell into this little trap once before. I couldn't be better. I am great. I'm not great, but I feel great. How's You're as that? good as you could possibly be? You uh, couldn't be better? Uh, I'm doing pretty okay. Okay. I'm well, doing, I've been worse. Okay. It, That's always safe, right? <laughs> I had a buddy in grad school, you yeah. know, and I would say, his name was Dan. I'd be like, Dan, how you doing today? He said, mm, I've been worse. And I finally asked him. He'd always answer. I said, why, yeah. why is it? He says, well, it's always true, Yeah. and it won't make the guy asking me feel bad. I like that. Yeah. Would you like to share the joke that you told me before before we were on oh, the Oh, yeah, air? the difference between the United States and France. What is the difference between the United States and France, David? Okay, so in France, they have... Uh, three religions and 10,000 cheeses. Yes. In America, we have three cheeses and 10,000 religions. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that. Let's lead off here uh, with an email. This is from Teresa listening to us in Boise on Salt and Light Radio. She says, what is the church's stand on a person being an organ donor at the time of their death? Oh, you're allowed to be an organ donor, but we'd prefer that you be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Rim shot. <laughs> wow. That is very good. Okay, so it is perfectly fine. Yeah. Perfectly yeah. fine. Very good. As long as it's your, your own organs that you're donating. Well, I would hope so. Yeah. I have a Wurlitzer in the basement. Maybe we could use that. Uh, here's one from uh, Eric in Sun Prairie. <laughs> Michael is shaking his head. Eric in Pr- Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, wants to know, uh, my question is regarding Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. The way I understand this is that those that ignored the invitations of the king are those that go to hell. The man who did attend, but not wearing a wedding garment, is thrown in darkness, but will have wailing and grinding of teeth. Is this a a representation of purgatory or hell? Are wailing and gnashing of teeth representative of purgatory, like in the parable of talents for the servant that buried the talent? Can I use this to explain purgatory to others? Again, that's from Eric in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go through the whole parable. And honestly, the parables of Jesus are, sometimes there are several layers of meaning embedded in them. Mm -hmm. And almost always they are addressing his specific context of ministry to Judea, and the rejection of his ministry by the Pharisees, right? So that's that's always a helpful frame of reference to keep in the back of your mind when you read this. So um, obviously the uh, the uh, the king who gives the wedding feast is compared to God, obviously, and he gives a an invitation um, to to his familiars, and the response is, "Eh, we don't want to come. We're busy." Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it was obviously the rejection of Christ's ministry by the Jews. And so then he goes out and invites everybody, the hoi polloi, if you will. And this is precisely what happened in the ministry of Christ. Uh, the uh, the apostles went first to the Jews, and then when they were turned away from the synagogues, they went and began preaching to the Gentiles, which was God's intent all along, to mm-hmm. reconcile the whole world to himself in Christ. Mm-hmm. And in short order, uh, this Jewish religion, this offshoot of first century Judaism, became a predominantly Gentile religion. Um, but... The, there's a warning in there, of course, embedded in the parable, mm-hmm. that while 
uh, all are called, few are chosen. Uh And there is a response to the gospel in repentance and faith that is necessary so that we need to be clothed in righteousness in order to be admitted into our eternal dwellings. So God desires the salvation of all men, desires that no one be lost. All right. However, uh, it's, uh, it does require repentance and, fa- repentance and faith on our part. Not all who say, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Very good. Appreciate that. It's uh, seven minutes after the hour. We're ready to go to the phones here. Give us a call if you have a question for Dr. David Anders. 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. Especially uh, reaching out today to all all of you who are non-Catholic. Uh, Perhaps you were a Catholic uh, earlier in your life, and then you kind of wandered away for whatever reason. And now you're thinking about coming back, but you're thinking, I don't know. There was that one thing that happened to me when I was in uh, ninth grade, or there there was that one thing that happened to me in college, and I just don't know. Well, let's talk about that. What's keeping you from becoming a Catholic? 1-800-585-9396. This is called a communion here on EWTN. Sharing the fullness of the Catholic faith. 1-800-585-9396. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Coming up later today on Cresta in the Afternoon. Throughout his campaign, Donald Trump criticized President Obama for failing to acknowledge the Islamic connection to terrorism. Sebastian Gorka joins us to talk about the policy changes and strategies we might see in the Trump presidency. We're also going to take a look at what Pope Francis said to Lutherans in Sweden and how Catholics are looking at the Reformations. Cresta in the Afternoon, later today on EWTN Radio. It's time for your favorite EWTN program, but there's no radio? No problem. Download the EWTN app at EWTN.com slash mobile and enjoy on-demand live streams of your favorite EWTN radio and TV shows right now. 60 on 10 with Monsignor Charles Pope. The third commandment, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. You know, of all the commandments, it might seem that we would get this one right. After all, it commands us to rest one day. But so often we're off to our own pursuits. God asks us to take one day to stop, reflect, rejoice, spend time with Him and with our family. But so often we're running everywhere else. It's also a day for worship. Uh, The book of Leviticus says, Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is the Sabbath of the Lord. And the book of Hebrews says that we should not neglect to meet together, as is a habit of some. And so again, we're asked by God to spend time reflecting and worshiping, and likewise spend time with our family. The third commandment, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. Hello, this is Father John Paul Mary. This is Debbie Giorgiani, co-host of Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. My friends, this is Bishop Kevin Van of the Diocese of Orange. I want to thank you very much for listening to the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1-800-585-9396 10 after the hour. It was very nice to hear the voice of uh, Bishop Kevin Van on that little uh, promo that we had there a moment ago. Uh, Bishop Van was here in Birmingham for the uh, EWTN Catholic Radio Conference last week. That's right, he was. And uh, what a delightful and holy man. He was our keynote speaker at the conference, and uh, it is it is a real pleasure to be partnering with the Diocese of Orange and with Bishop Van uh, on a lot of our new uh, radio outreaches, the program Call Me Catholic with Peggy Normandon that we hear every uh, Saturday. That comes from the Orange County uh, Studios. Fantastic. Delighted to have him on. We're going to get to the phones here in just a moment, and the phone number is 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. And uh, let's go to a quick text here from Rudy. Rudy says, I am a Catholic. My question is, what is the difference between divorce and annulment? Okay, great. So divorce is the uh, dissolution of a marriage. Yeah. Right now... Um, Catholic Church doesn't have anything, has, uh, does not recognize divorce, does not understand that it is possible at all to dissolve a valid marriage. Right? So divorce is a civil procedure whereby, you know, a court 
arranges for the dissolution of the bond between two married people. All right, mm-hmm. but of course the Catholic Church sees no validity to that at all. Doesn't recognize it as any kind of as anything. It's meaningless. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, it may have some. It may have some significance in civil law, but has no theological or or uh, moral significance. Except it's immoral to leave your spouse. I mean that's. That's the significance of divorce. It's mm-hmm. wholly negative, mm-hmm. right? And radically contradicts the will of God. Not only, I mean, it's, it's so radically c- contradicts the will of God. In the book of Malachi, the Lord says, I hate divorce. Yeah. I hate divorce. And Jesus, of course, in answering the question whether it's lawful for a man to divorce his wife, says that it radically contradicts the intent of God in creation, which is to create man and woman to be joined together in a lifelong, indissoluble fellowship. Mm. So that's the significance of divorce. Sure. Annulment is a declaration by a church court that two people who were putatively married, people that represented themselves as married, yeah. were not in fact married. Okay. All right. So it's not it's not uh, separating two people that were bound together by a valid marriage. It's rather recognizing that there was no bond there to begin with. Let me give you a kind of a, a dead ringer illustration of this. Okay. Let us say that uh, that a couple went in front of a civil court mm-hmm. and pronounced vows to quote unquote marry one another. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, they were um, but the vows went something like this: I promise to love, honor, and cherish you until next Wednesday. <laughs> okay, and for all intents and purposes, that's what some people vow. You know, that's what they intend. All right. Well, the church would look at that and say, "Well, the court may have said that's a marriage that lasts, you know, a week and a half." Uh, we don't. We say no because marriage is by definition a lifelong and indissoluble union. So if you only vowed to be together till next Wednesday, you're vowing to do something, but it isn't marriage. I knew a couple back in the day, um, and this this couple, their attitude. And by the way, the couple is now divorced. This couple's attitude was, we'll do this for now as long as everything is, seems to be okay, and if it stops working, then we'll do something else. Well, some people will pronounce this absurd vow, instead of as long as we both shall live, they say as long as we both shall love. Really? Uh, yeah. Now, that, that, is, that is just terrible. Mm, That's just yeah. awful, 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 awful. You know, I, I knew a man, or I knew of a man one time that went to my cousin, a friend of mine, and said, uh, I'm going to divorce my wife. And my cousin said, why? He says, well, I don't love my wife anymore cousin said, well, I have the solution to your problem. He says, what's that? He says, love your wife. Start loving her. And he says, we don't understand. I don't love her. He says, oh, I do understand. Solution? Start loving her. It's an act of the will. There you go. There it is. Appreciate that. And uh, at 14 minutes after the hour, we are going to get to the phones here. We do have a line open for you before we do that. 1-800-585-9396. 1-800-585-9396. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders here on Call to Communion. All right, quarter after, let's go to Marion in Maryland. I like that. Listening to EWTN on Guadalupe Radio. Marion, what's your question today? Hey, Marion. Hello, Marion. Marion, are you there? Marion? Uh oh. Hey, Marion. I'll, I'll bet she's got her radio on. Marion? Yes. Now turn your radio off, okay? Okay. Okay, go right Can you ahead. Can hear me now? Yes, go right ahead, please. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. That's okay, um, Marion. What's your question today? I, I will get around. Um, I'll try to get to my question quickly. I'm Greek Orthodox, and so um, is my husband. And over the past, I don't know, since my son started in pre-K in a Catholic school, been looking into Catholicism and finding out, you know, what the differences were between Orthodoxy and Catholicism, so I would be able to guide my son and explain and, Mm -hmm. and that. Um, And in the course of, he's 10 now, and in fifth grade, and in the course of that time, um, worked through a lot of things, determined that I would like to um, be united with the the Catholic Church, become Catholic, and my husband is just not there yet, and he doesn't seem to to think we need, that needs to happen, then... um, I guess because of all the similarities, and he feels salva- we can still gain salvation in the Orthodox Church, so he doesn't know why we would need to do that. 
Okay. I don't know what to do other than to pray. Okay, thanks, Mary, and I really appreciate the question, and uh, uh, and I'm sensitive to your situation very much so. Okay, so a couple of things. Uh, it is true, of course, that the Catholic and Orthodox churches share a very great many things. They share a lot of the faith and the sacraments and the Word of God in common, and these things that they have in common can be, for an Orthodox Christian, uh, means of sanctification and redemption and ultimately salvation. Well, that's true. That's objectively true. Okay. What's also true is that if we don't follow our consciences, we are in sin and potentially in grave sin. So uh, when a Greek Orthodox Christian who, through no fault of his own, does not understand or has been taught to disbelieve in the primacy of the Bishop of Rome, his juridical primacy, and the necessity for a full and complete visible union in the mm -hmm. body of Christ, does not understand the necessity of that juridical union. Um, and, uh, and so in participating in his orthodox rite, uh, he is not actually, he's got a badly formed conscience, but he's, but he's in obedience to conscience through no fault of his own. He's invincibly ignorant then, of course, he could be saved, provided he dies in the state of sanctifying grace. He d dies in God's friendship, you know, theosis, as the, as, the, um, okay. as the Orthodox like to say. He could be saved. But what happens to an Orthodox person who comes to understand the truth of the Catholic faith, the juridical primacy of the Bishop of Rome, and the necessity for full and visible union, who then fails to come into that full communion with the Church? Well, that Orthodox person is now in violation of their own conscience. And to, to, uh, to disobey conscience, as the Protestant theologian Martin Luther said, is neither right nor safe. Is neither right nor safe to disobey conscience. And so the first thing I would do with your husband is to, well, to love him and to be patient with him. Yes. And to say, I understand where you're coming from, and I appreciate it, okay, that you don't see the necessity. But I would like for you to understand that where I'm coming from and that for me, this is now a matter of conscience. This is now a matter of conscience. And, and uh, that if I do not go ahead and become Catholic, that I'm in violation of my conscience, and therefore I'm in sin. Now, uh, please don't put me in a position where I have to violate my conscience. That's an appeal that I think a lot of husbands would respect and respond to. Right, so that's where I would start. Right. Then, the other thing is that the Catholic Church has a fairly liberal attitude towards admitting the Orthodox to the sacraments of the Eucharist, Confession, and Last Rites. All right? And an Orthodox person who uh, believes in the Catholic nature of the sacraments and is well disposed, properly disposed to receive the Eucharist can do so in a Catholic Church. So your husband could actually come with you to the Catholic Church and participate uh, to a very great extent, not, not fully, but to a very great extent in the liturgical and sacramental life of the Catholic Church without actually formally professing his adherence to the Catholic faith. Yeah. Okay? Um, and, uh, and again, that, that signals just how close the Catholic Church holds the Orthodox in, uh, in, her, in her heart and in her mind, in her regard. Okay? So that might be a, a kind of a bridge, a way of, of uh, uh, crossing this threshold yeah. without too much stress. Another thing is, I don't know where you live. Uh, I think you live in Maryland, Maryland someplace. Uh -huh. I would bet just about anything that someplace within driving distance of your house, there is going to be a Byzantine Rite Catholic Church. Oh. There is going to be a Catholic Church that celebrates the liturgy uh, according to the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom that you're familiar with in mm -hmm. your Greek Orthodox Church. Um, uh, you might find uh, Byzantine, you might find Ruthenian, you might find Melkite, but you're going to find an Eastern Rite Catholic Church someplace near you. And uh, that... Uh, that would be a very logical place to go, and I think it would also be something that your husband could be very, very comfortable with, because you'd be in full communion with the Bishop of Rome, mm -hmm. but the liturgical life of the Church would be very, very similar, almost identical to what he's used to. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, of course, he could come there, and he could the same same stipulations would apply as long as he was properly disposed, could receive the sacraments in that church as well. And it would be, uh, uh, it, it, you know, for your children, that would be a, a really, really easy transition because you could 
teach them about the Pope and the Holy Father and mm-hmm. the Universal Church as a Catholic, um, but participate in the whole cultural patrimony yeah. of the Greek uh, Greek culture and the Greek Church the way you're used to, um, and and even the you know the catechetical documents and so forth would be very very similar to what they already have. Your husband might concede to go there. Uh, more easily than he would to a Roman right church. Mm -hmm. So that's another suggestion I would have for you. And then finally, you know, I don't know if if he's much of a, of a reader, if he's interested in exploring these w- issues with you. But one of the books that I always like to recommend is by Aidan Nichols, and it's called Rome and the Eastern Churches. And it's a it's not polemical. It's 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 not an attack on the Orthodox. It's just a, a, a historical descriptive analysis of the relationship of the Bishop of Rome to all of the Eastern churches throughout history. I think it does a really good job of pointing out the points of commonality and difference, but it also, in a very gentle way, makes the case for the primacy of the Bishop of Rome. Um, A book that is not at all like that and is much more polemical and definitely takes the gloves off is by James Lacutus, and it's called The Divine Primacy of the Bishop of Rome. And uh, Lacutus was a Greek Orthodox, and he became a Catholic, and and he's a an apologist for the Roman Church, uh, pretty mm-hmm. much. I mean, in in a, in a, like I said, in a much more polemical way. So that's for you to judge in your own prudential reasoning whether it's better to take the soft and gentle approach or to take the more of the taking the gloves off approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and then you know one final thought that occurs to me: there was a, a Russian theologian and philosopher Alexander Soloviev, who, as far as I know, never became Catholic. Uh, he died Russian Orthodox, but he was well known for believing the truth of the Catholic faith and the necessity of Roman primacy, and he made a case for uh, the reunion of the Orthodox with Rome. Um, I mean, he wanted he wanted to see uh, you know the whole Church come yeah. over and and join back with the or- with uh, with the Catholic Church again, um, and uh, so that might be another avenue to explore. You know, if, again, if your husband's a kind of a reader and a sure. thinker on these issues, so those are awesome ideas about how you might proceed in this. And, uh, and again, you don't need to beat him over the head with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And you can go slowly with him and be patient and loving and understand that he's not where you are, and, uh, and, uh, but he'll get there one day. Is that helpful for you, Marion? Um, it, it is helpful. It, it's, it's just been very difficult. Oh, um, I'm, 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 I'm it, sure. It is helpful. I don't Thank know anybody you. in your situation who has not had difficulty. That would, go, that would be true for me. That's true for Tom. Uh, that's true for almost any married convert who's coming from another tradition. Mm-hmm. It, it's 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 always hard, but it gets better. It does, and we will keep you in prayer, Mary. And thank you so much for your call. Twenty four after the hour, almost twenty five after. This is called a communion here on EWTN. Want to hit a? Oh, let me give you that phone number again: one eight hundred five eight five nine three nine six. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, one eight hundred five eight five. 9396. Here's that quick question. This is from Jim, a text that just came in. I read in last week's readings about baptism of the dead. I thought that was a Latter-day Saints kind of a thing. What were they alerting, uh, alluding to? Sure. So there's only one passage of the New Testament that makes any reference to this. Uh, and St. Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, speaks about it. Uh, he, do- he gives no definition. He doesn't explain the practice. He alludes to it as something that was going on in Corinth. Not to approve of it, yeah. All right, but simply to draw an illustration or an analogy from from it. Okay. Now we know from early church councils, like the Council of Carthage, for instance, I think it's Canon 18, mm-hmm. specifically de- specifically forbids applying the sacrament of baptism or the Eucharist, for that matter, to the bodies of the dead. All right. So um, it it se- there it seems to have been, at least in some circles, a superstitious practice of of applying the sacraments to dead bodies. But the church repudiated that, rejected it absolutely out of hand. Was that what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians? We don't know. There's just not enough data from the text to let us know. What we do know is that the Mormon practice of baptizing uh, vicariously on behalf of the dead Mm -hmm. um, is a Mormon practice and has no precedent in ancient Christianity at all. All right. So, uh, and that's forbidden. Okay. Very good. When we come back, we'll uh, grab a text here from Caleb. Fascinating question. I I think you'll get a lot out of this. We also have a line open for you at the moment, 1-800-585-9396. 
9396. Do you have a question for Dr. David Anders? He's in the house. 1-800-585-9396. Call to communion in progress on this Tuesday here on EWTN, the Global Catholic Radio Networks. Do stay with us. From EWTN News Nightly in Washington, D.C., I'm Brian Patrick with your EWTN Newslink. Speaker Paul Ryan is expected to keep his post as House Republicans take leadership votes today. Ryan distanced himself from candidate Donald Trump but says he's on board with the president-elect. President Obama is in Athens on day one of his last scheduled international trip as president. He's reassuring Greece's president and other allies in light of Donald Trump's election of America's continued commitment to NATO. The head of the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, will lead the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Cardinal Daniel DiNardo was elected USCCB president today in Baltimore. Los Angeles Archbishop Jose Gomez is the vice president-elect. And the U.S. Forest Service says nearly three dozen wildfires are burning tens of thousands of acres in parts of Georgia and the Carolinas, Kentucky and Tennessee. About a thousand firefighters are on the fire lines. I'm Brian Patrick with your EWTN Newslink. Join us tonight for EWTN News Nightly. Coming to EWTN Television. For 2,000 years, the arts have handed on the faith of the church to generation after generation of believers. But in today's visual culture, our sense of beauty and truth is seemingly lost. Artistic expression has become merely another form of entertainment. I think that the most important thing that we can do in, in the church and in the arts today is to recover the notion of beauty as a positive means of truth. Now, a transforming rediscovery of sacred and living truths revealed through today's Virtuosos, a modern-day renaissance of sacred art in the new evangelization against a canvas of marble and mosaic, stained glass and stone, an epiphany of true beauty, the beauty of faith, an EWTN original production. Coming to EWTN Television. EWTN. Live truth. Live Catholic. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. 1 800 585 9396. Great radio straight ahead because it's Tuesday. We've got Barbara McGuigan, our pro life warrior, standing by answering your calls on pro-life and life issues on EWTN Open Line Tuesday. It's coming to you in about 30 minutes here on EWTN. Many of our EWTN radio stations will, of course, carry that program. We're getting calls screened right now at 1-800-585-9396. We'll go to a call in just a moment from Susan. Uh, Before we do that, I want to hit a quick text here from Caleb. Caleb says, how does one determine the limits of acceptable altruistic self-sacrifice in Catholicism. For example, jumping on a grenade to save your friends, your three friends, is acceptable. Why isn't it acceptable for the same man to kill himself to save the same three friends by donating his organs at the 11th hour? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we have to distinguish here between, uh, we're talking about acts that are good or bad having effects that are good or bad, okay? There are two different moral theories that come into play here. One of them is the principle of the double effect, and the other one is consequentialism. Catholicism, Catholic moral theory, embraces the doctrine of the double effect and rejects consequentialism. Okay. What is consequentialism? Consequentialism is doing an evil so that good may result. Very, very common expression of consequentialism in our in our current day culture is, hey, I I I can't carry this child to term because I need to finish college or get my job or get tenure or Mm -hmm. it's too psychologically burdensome Mm -hmm. or whatever, so I'm going to abort the child in order to bring about these good effects. All right? It may be true that finishing college and getting your job and doing all these, these may all be good things, all right? But to kill the child is an intrinsically, gravely evil thing. All right? We can never justify an intrinsic evil, um, in order to bring about a good effect. That's consequentialism, and it's absolutely ruled out in Catholic moral thinking. Um, The principle of the double effect, on the other hand, says that I can choose a good object even if it sometimes brings about sort of an ancillary evil effect. All right, I can choose to do a good thing that may have an evil consequence, 
um, if my intent is the good object desired, intended and performed, not the evil effect, and there's a kind of proportionality between the things, okay? All right. So I would think that in the case that you raise, all right, so jumping on a grenade, for instance, uh, what, it, what am I, what am I, what's, what is the act, what's the, the essential nature of the act as such? All right, it's to shield my friends from a grenade, mm-hmm. all right? Um, what is the, the negative ancillary effect? It blows me to smithereens, mm-hmm. right? But I'm not intending to blow myself to smithereens. And in fact, if I could do this in a way that wouldn't blow me to smithereens, I'd be perfectly happy, all right? Um, and uh, um, however, if what I intend is my own death, uh, you know, to say, uh, spare my family the, the trouble of caring for me, which might often be a justification someone might give for for self euthanasia mm-hmm. you know, or suicide and so forth. Well, that's not allowed because here, what I'm actually intending is I'm intending to kill myself. All right, and uh, in order to save my family the burden. Now, in the first case, I'm going to jump on the grenade to save my friends. Um, I really don't want to die, and I'd be happy with just you know having my leg blown off instead. Mm-hmm. All right, um, or you know if I can grab my buddy's body armor and put it on before I jump, even better. All right, I really don't want to die. I'm really not intending the death. I don't intend the de- my death as a means to an end. What I'm intending is to shield my friends from the grenade. I Principle see. of the double effect versus consequentialism. Very good. Let's go now to Susan in Portland, Oregon, listening to EWTN on Modern Day Radio. Susan, what's your question today? Hey, Susan? Susan? Susan's got her radio on. This happens sometimes. Um, hi. Susan, hi, yes. go, go right so ahead, please. I, um, so I am wondering. Um, my, I was raised um, Baptist um, fundamentalist. My husband was raised um, Methodist and Presbyterian. Uh, both of us were uh, baptized by immersion in our um, faith. And um, our son actually... Um, goes to Catholic school, and so we made that choice for him. Um, he uh, will, at the time, um, he's, he has not been baptized in any faith, and um, I would like to present him the choice um, to where he, he chooses to be baptized. I guess the question that we have is, um, how would we... How would we explain that to the side of our family that would um, be very opposed to that? We have one side of our family who would be opposed to that, and another side of our family who would be very accepting of that. Okay, let me back Uh, up and make sure I understand the story so far. Okay, so you were raised in a fundamentalist church. Your husband, you said, was raised Presbyterian? Yes, and and Methodist. Both and Methodist, okay, and both of you have been baptized. Your son attends a Catholic school and has yes. not been baptized, and you no. would like for him to have the opportunity to be baptized. All right. How old is and your I son? Get, how old is he? Yes. Yeah. He's five and a half. He is five and a half. So, so he really has not yet attained the age of reason. No. Okay. Um, if your son were to be baptized, would he be baptized in the Catholic Church? I mean, I guess I would be giving him the choice of that, because I... Um, I was not given the choice, and I don't, um, if I could retract my ba- my baptism, I would. Um, I don't have a particularly happy um, immersion baptism story. Um, and so I guess for me, I, I want him to decide what he wants. Okay, let me, let me back up. Let me, let me, let me say first one thing. Okay, so first of all, I am certainly, I'm heart sick about whatever your experience was that left you with kind of a bad taste in your mouth, what your experience of baptism. And I, I don't know what that is. I don't need to know. I'm sorry, okay? But I, I, it, it, it hurts my heart to hear anyone say, I would, I would retract my baptism. Because perhaps you haven't thought about what you gained through that sacrament of baptism. St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, that we die with Christ in baptism to be reborn again with him to new life. The Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3 that baptism saves us. And St. Paul says in Galatians 3 verse 27 that whoever has been baptized has clothed himself with Christ. 
Peter, again, speaking of the power of baptism, says that it makes us priests, a kingdom of priests. So uh, Jesus uses the, the metaphor of water, the rebirth by water and the Spirit. And St. Paul, of course, in Titus, speaks about the washing of regeneration. So baptism accomplishes many, many things in our life. First of all, it washes us, washes us clean of sin. You know, St. Peter tells the gathered at Pentecost to receive baptism for the remission of their sins. That's Acts chapter 2. So our sins are remitted in baptism. It makes us children of God and members of Christ's body, the church. That's why Paul says that we become clothed with Christ. It also makes us priests in the Catholic Church. Priests are appointed to offer sacrifice, the sacrifice of our very lives, as well as Christ's body and blood in the Holy Eucharist. So, you know, Romans chapter 12, Paul exhorts the believers and says, I urge you, brethren, to offer yourselves as a pure and living sacrifice to God. Okay? We're equipped, we're configured to do this through baptism. So your sins are washed away, you receive the grace of God, sonship of God, you become members of Christ and priests in the Catholic Church. Whatever else may have happened in your life, that is a gift of such sublime dignity that no man or woman should ever regret that, no matter what. Okay? You're yourself included. Now, that's what we want for your son. We want him to be joined to Christ in this sacramental mystery. We want this intensely. We should want it for him more than we want him to have education, uh, physical health, or anything else. We want him to be a member of Christ. Now, at five and a half years old, he is not of the age of reason, and so he is not competent to understand or decide these things for himself. And if I may be so bold, I think it would be wrong to put the burden of that on him. All yeah, right, I yeah. really do, okay? But there is nothing wrong. In fact, it is entirely appropriate for you to decide that for him because you want these things on his behalf. You can do that as his parent, okay? St. Peter in Acts chapter 2 says to the people, they say, what should we do to be saved? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. The promise is for you and for your children yep. and for your children. Acts chapter 16, when the Philippian jailer repents and believes and asks what he must do to be saved, Paul baptizes him and his whole household. Okay, so the text doesn't say the promises for you and those of your children that say they want to come along. No, your, your parent, all right, he belongs to your household. You and your husband are the head of that household. You make decisions that affect your family. Go back and read the Old Testament and see how many of the Old Testament patriarchs said to their sons, hey, you guys make up for yourself whether you're going to follow Yahweh. That's no, 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 uh -uh, no, no. Joshua, when he crossed into the Jordan, crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land, what did he say? He said, I and my house will follow the Lord. Exactly. All right, that's what you're deciding. I and my house. I and I am. Ah, excuse me. I and my house. All right. The child can't make that decision, but you can make that for him vicariously and believe on his behalf. Um, and that's what. If I were in your shoes, that is what I would do. Now, if you bring him to be baptized in the Catholic Church, um, then uh, you are pledging that you will raise him in the Catholic faith. And that is a condition that the priest will make of you before he will accept the child for baptism, that he be raised, that there's a, a, a well-founded hope the child will be brought up Catholic. Normally, that happens because the parents are Catholic. Uh, there are exceptions. So if, if you feel a, a strong enough affinity with the Catholic faith that you're willing to make that commitment, um, then he could be presented for baptism in the Catholic Church. And that's what I would do. And if I were you, I'd do it tomorrow. Absolutely. Susan, thank you so much for your call. 40 after the hour. This is called a communion here on EWTN. We have a line open for you at 1-800-585-9396. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Well, you know what? You've got a super opportunity here, and you may not even know about it. Can imagine how cool it would be to represent EWTN to all of your friends to represent EWTN to your parish, you can do it. You can become an EWTN media missionary. Now, if you've never heard this term, what EWTN media missionaries do is prayerfully take EWTN to parishes and the community through our print and electronic media 
we provide it. It's absolutely free. Imagine that. Maybe you've got a little display in the back of your church, in the front of your church, uh, where you could, uh, you know, with the permission of your pastor, put some pamphlets out there. Maybe it would have the radio schedule on it or the TV schedule or some information about EWTN. It's absolutely free, and we think it's a wonderful thing, and thousands of your friends all over the, all over the world are doing it right now. So visit EWTNmissionaries.com, EWTNmissionaries.com today. Join us in sharing the eternal word with the world. How cool is that? 42 after the hour, we go now to Jill in Bolton, Missouri, listening to EWTN Radio on KEXS. Hey, Jill, what's, question, what's your question today? Uh, hi, I left the church about 10 years ago, and I'm, I was married in the church, but now I'm remarried outside of the church. Uh-huh. Sometimes I go to weddings in my family, and I've never been going to communion, but my sister said that the Pope said it was okay for divorced people to go to communion. Is, and so can you clarify whether it is or not okay? I can, I can clarify. The law of the church on this matter is very clear, that if you were validly married in the Catholic Church— then that relationship, as Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 19, is indissoluble until death. And there is no power on earth, not the Pope, not the Supreme Court, not the President, nobody, that can dissolve what God has joined together. What God has joined together, let man not separate. That's what Jesus said. Okay. So a person who is validly married, um, which is by definition for life, and then subsequently, regardless of what any civil court says, takes up with another person and lives with them in a conjugal union, well, that person is objectively guilty of the sin of adultery, and because that's a grave sin, that person cannot be made ad- admitted to Holy Communion. Okay, that, And that's the law of the Church, and that has always been the law of the Church and remains the law of the Church. Now, uh, Pope Francis recently published a document in which he talked about what is the best way pastorally to care for people in that situation. And the Pope obviously has a heart, all right, to try to serve these folks. And so he raised a lot of questions about their subjective culpability. To what extent do they really understand the teaching of the Church? To what extent, you know, do, can, can they follow it? And so on and so forth. And these are all sort of pastoral questions that he raised uh, about individual cases. But in the document, he, it, it wasn't a legal document. He didn't change the law of the Church. He simply was trying to kind of pry open the conversation a bit and, uh, and engage at a pastoral level with more sensitivity and try to figure out how to serve these people. Um, but the law of the Church remains the law of the Church because it's founded in divine revelation and the truth of the indissolubility of marriage. Hope that's helpful for you, Jill. Uh, 44 after the hour. This is called a communion here on EWTN. We go to Gene in Nebraska, listening to EWTN on Spirit Catholic Radio. Hey there, Gene. What's your question today? Hello. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, my question is, why is it that uh, possibly a, a nun is either asked or vowed to take a uh, financial poverty vow, but a priest is not? Is that is that correct? Okay, thanks. Appreciate that. So it's not just nuns, all right? It's it's anybody that takes up the councils of perfection, all right? That's nuns and uh, male religious also, monks, friars, and so forth, uh, that take this up and they they pledge themselves to poverty, chastity, and obedience, all right? Because these are the way this these are the councils of perfection. These are the way of perfection. You know, Christ said, for instance. Um, that uh, that uh, in Matthew 19, talking about the vow of uh, perfect continence, mm-hmm. that some people are called to this, but not everybody. All right, um, Saint Paul deals with the same thing, of course, in First Corinthians chapter six, six and seven. He says, "I wish that you were all like me and perfectly continent, but not everybody has this gift. So, you want to do it? That's fine. If you're not called to it, that's fine too. Um, you can be chaste, but you don't have to be perfectly continent. You can go get married instead." Um, and in a number of places in the Gospels, Jesus says, if you would be perfect, if you would be perfect, then go sell all your possessions, give to the poor, come and follow me. All right? But not everybody is called to that life of radical poverty. But there are people in the church, always have been, men and women, mm-hmm. who take up that life of ra- radical poverty, uh, total continence, and, and obedience as, the, as that more perfect way, right? even though not everyone is called to that more perfect way. But thanks be to God, some people are, because they remain for all of us signs of contradiction, icons of, personal, of, uh, of perfect holiness to serve the church in an imminent, preeminent kind of way. Now... What about the life of the priesthood? Well, the priests ought to be, of course, should be, 
uh, exemplary Christians, but they're uh, but, but a priest like uh, like a layman in the world is not necessarily called by the nature of his office to take up that life of Christian perfection in the way that a male or female religious is. Now, there are priests who are also bound by religious vows. So there are, for instance, we have here at EWTN, we've got a number of Franciscan priests. They all take the vows of poverty, chastity, yeah. and obedience. Yep. Okay. Um, you know, any religious order like the Jesuits, they take vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, and uh, as I said in the Monty Python skit, a fanatical devotion to the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fourth Jesuit vow, roughly translated. You know, love it. Um, Dominicans, the same thing. You know, uh, I was just with a Mercedarian, third order Mercedarian in in uh, Tampa this weekend. Mercedarian. Yes, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, don't slaughter me, please. Don't murder. I've never me. heard of it. Okay, and they take a fourth vow, which is uh, essentially the vow of martyrdom where they they willingly give up their lives uh, to redeem captives taken in war it's particularly in the in the Andalusian area mm. where they were, the Muslims would frequently uh capture uh kidnap Christians and they would ransom them and the mercedarians would go down there and they would ransom they would ransom Christian captives with their own lives wow. you know so radical radical yeah. self donation um and there are of course I've always been priests that have taken that um but uh, it's not of the essence of the priesthood per se that they vow themselves to radical poverty, and the church has never required that. Um, now, you know, when you look at a diocesan priest, not a not a religious priest, but a diocesan priest guy serves a parish, well, he takes a salary, just like anybody does. He's got to pay for his car, you know, he's got to sure. keep the lights on, he's got to have food in the refrigerator, he's not living in a religious community like like religious priests are. And uh, and he doesn't have a wife, and he doesn't have kids, so there's nobody to take care of him when he grows old. He better have a retirement plan. Well, yeah. You don't have the priest living under the bridge when he gets too old to, to serve Mass anymore. <laughs> He's got to have somebody to take care of himself, sure. so he needs a 401k like everybody else. Now, they're supposed to live lives of simplicity, so, you know, you don't want your priest, like, cruising up to the parish in a Lamborghini. That wouldn't look so hot, you yeah. know. In fact, I know, uh, I know there's a, a wealthy... Uh, Catholic layman that I know, you know him too, Tom, who goes to our parish, and uh, he drives a nice car, drives a Mercedes, and one time the pastor said, do you really need to be driving that car? And he says, tell you what, Father, here are the keys, it's yours. I got one condition, you got to drive it. Ooh. And the priest is like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> you take it back, you take it nice back. Nice try. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's so, But then, of course, the Roman Rite priest also takes vows of chastity, perfect continence, and, um, and of course, they all take vows of obedience to their bishop, but they're not they're not required to take vows of radical poverty, okay. though to be sure many of them do. Sure. Gene, thank you so much for your call. Here's a quick text from John. He says, I thought in order for an Orthodox to receive the sacraments in the Catholic Church, the one condition is that he does not have access to his minister. Okay, so here is Canon 843, number 3. Okay. This is the Code of Canon Law. Yeah. Catholic ministers administer the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, and anointing of the sick, licitly, that means lawfully, yeah. to members of Eastern churches which do not have full communion with the Catholic Church if they seek such on their own accord and are properly disposed. This okay. is also valid for members of other churches which, in the judgment of the Apostolic See, are in the same condition in regard to the sacraments as these Eastern churches. So that is to say churches with, with uh, valid priestly orders right, and apostolic right. succession. So the only conditions listed in the code are uh, that they seek it of their own accord and are properly disposed. Oh, very good. Thank you for your text. Here is Jay in Maine, probably listening to us on The Presence. Hey, Jay, what's your question today? Well, I'm curious about the Doubting Thomas um, concept, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I, I was born and brought up Catholic, and yet throughout my life journey, I, I repeatedly have serious doubts about things, and of course wonder what how that impacts salvation and redemption and all those other aspects of going to heaven. Great question. Okay, so appreciate it. Cardinal Newman once said, a thousand difficulties do not make one doubt. And I think that's very illuminating. It's necessary to understand what the nature of the ascent of faith is and what it's not. Okay, so faith is is a rational belief. It's not a leap in the dark. Faith is not irrational. Okay, it's a rational ascent to the credibility to to the evidence of credibility. So illustrate. Um, 
my wife is a trustworthy person. I mean, she would saw off her own toes before she would tell a lie, okay? And my wife comes to me and says, hey, I'm going to run to the grocery store. Well, I don't hesitate to believe her. Yeah. Okay? What if my wife came to me and said, David, don't ask me why. I can't explain, but I need you to go to the bank and take out, you know, some ridiculous sum of money. Take $10,000 out of our out of our retirement plan and hand it to me because I have an expense that is a life or death thing and I can't tell you about it but you got to trust me. I'm going to have a hard time believing that there really is a necessity for me to take the 10 grand out of the bank and hand it to her without any explanation at all. Mm-hmm. That's going to be hard for me. That's difficult. Difficult. That's sure, difficult. Sure. Okay. So at that point I'm forced to make a decision. What is the morally correct thing for me to do here? Am I going to believe a matter of great difficulty when I know my wife to be a trustworthy person, or am I going to choose to disbelieve her when I know that she's a trustworthy person? Now, what is the reasonable thing to do in that circumstance? All right, if I really see that she's in earnest, charity and reason would say, pay now, understand later. Mm-hmm. All right, that's what, and, and sometimes with the faith, that's the situation we're in. We're never asked to believe something irrational. We're never asked to believe something against reason or against logic. All right? And if you ever feel like you are, then you've made a mistake someplace in your construal of the faith. Okay? So no problem. Back up. Rethink it. Go to the theologians. Go to the doctors of the church. Figure out where your mistake was. But once you know that you understand the doctrine and you see that the thing is rational. And that's necessary. If you don't see its rationality, then you haven't properly understood it, because nothing in the faith is irrational. Once you see that it's, that it's not irrational, but you recognize that it's asking you to assent to something that may be beyond the grasp of reason, Yeah. all right? So, you know, there's no contradiction in the notion of of the incarnation of the two natures of Christ, for instance. All right? yeah. nothing, I'm not... I'm not stating anything that's logically contradictory here, but I'm stating something that I can't, I couldn't have figured out from reason, Mm -hmm. right? And I say, well, is the church credible? Is the revelation of God credible in this? Yes, it's credible, all right? But it's difficult. It's difficult. Can I make that ascent of faith that's difficult? And I think you'll find that you can. Yes, indeed. Jay, thank you so much for your call, and I'm going to try to squeeze a real quick one in here, a text from Stormy. Why do we use the names Jesus and Mary instead of Joshua and Miriam, since Yeshua seems closest to Joshua and Miriam, and that's and Miriam still a, a name used today? Right. What language was the New Testament written in? Uh, Greek. Yes, exactly. What was the Bible of the early Christians? Greek. Greek. Which is the Greek version of Jesus and Mary? Jesus and Mary. So there it is. Greek. That's where we leave it. Dr. David Andrews, thank you, my friend. Tom, thank you. My thanks also to Michael, Matt, and Jeff for doing a super job getting this show off the ground each and every day. See you tomorrow. God bless. God bless.